For today's colloquium, the students have been asked to prepare a three-minute, three-slide synopsis of their summer research projects. We're going to hold them pretty tightly to their three minutes with a few seconds buffer. There is a bell that I have near my chair over there, which will be rung um, after about three minutes. Well, exactly three minutes. Students, if you hear the bell, please finish your sentence. Uh, if you're the next student in line, please be prepared to come up to the podium. We will hold all the questions until after the last speaker has gone. Um, OK, everybody, those are the rules. <laughs> OK, great. So I will start with my own three-minute, three-slide introduction. Hello, again, my name is Jean Shar. I am an <laughs> astrophysicist here at the SETI Institute. Our research experience for undergraduates program is funded mainly by the National Science Foundation with additional funds from the NASA Astrobiology Institute, the NASA Kepler K2 General Observer Program, um, and Principia College. This summer, we have had 14 students that were selected out of a pool of over 200 applicants to take part in our 10-week internship program. The research areas all fall under the umbrella of astrobiology. That includes topics in physics, chemistry, astrophysics, geophysics, planetary science, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, um, and computer science. The students have carried out their research projects at the SETI Institute as well as NASA Ames. Students have taken part in NASA mission design studies. They've done field work. They've gone observing at professional telescope facilities. They've developed computer programs and simulations. They've run laboratory experiments, just to name a few of their activities. Our recruitment for the program is nationwide. Uh, here's a map that shows the distribution of where the students are coming from for this year. The students this year come from Cal Poly Pomona, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Cal State San Bernardino and San Marcos, UC Berkeley, Brown, University of Oklahoma, Colgate University, Oberlin College, and Juniata College and Principia College um, this year. The students, or excuse me, the colleges that have COMPARE written next to them are part of a network of California universities and community colleges where there is targeted recruitment under the COMPARE program, which is directed by Dr. Alexander Rudolph at Cal Poly Pomona. I will let the students tell you about their individual research projects today, but I'll take a minute to tell you about some of the other experiences that they've had this summer, and there have been many. <laughs> They've attended our weekly colloquium series and, of course, are taking over today's colloquium. After each colloquium, they've had a casual pizza lunch with the speaker and had a, have had a chance to talk with the speaker about their science. They made a trip to Lassen National Park to study geology. They observed at the Allen Telescope Array. They got a personalized tour of NASA Ames. They observed the Perseid meteor shower at Fremont Peak Observatory. And a favorite this year is they got a tour of Google headquarters. I'd like to thank our CEO, Bill Diamond, our Director of Education and Public Outreach, Edna DeVore, Alex Rudolph at Cal Poly Pomona, especially all of our mentors who supported these wonderful students, and the support staff here at the SETI Institute for supporting this internship program and for helping make it the huge success that it is. At this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to our first student to start their three-minute colloquium. So, Melissa, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Melissa Hannon. I'm from Cal State University, San Bernardino. I'm studying physics there, and my mentor is Peter Yaniscus. And today, I wanted to show you this first slide. This should look pretty familiar to some of you if you got the chance last week to see the Perseid meteor shower. This is um, one of my favorite things this summer. Um, when I first came into the SETI Institute, I didn't really know anything about meteors except they came from comets and asteroids, which is something I was interested in. And if you look at the top right of this slide, you're gonna see a meteor with the color green. And what I really found this summer is how much you can learn from colors, especially those coming from meteors. 
So we have two sources for our meteors because we have two sources for comets. We have the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. The Kuiper belt we know uh, is made of material that is from our solar system, but we have an idea that maybe the Oort cloud took material from different stars when our star was forming. So how are we supposed to learn about this? We're going to use meteors because meteors are a great way to probe the mineral, mineral composition of comets um, when they come into the atmosphere. So what we use is a spectrograph. I'm using the CAMS network. We have three locations, Fremont Peak, at Lick Observatory, and in Sunnyvale. This spectrograph is from Sunnyvale. We take a meteor, as you can see on the bottom right corner, there is a meteor on the left, and on the right, you can see that it's broken up into its colors. There is blue, green, yellow, and red. And these are the different parts of the meteor. So the, green, the blue is the iron, and the green is magnesium, the yellow is sodium, and the red is the N2 band. So from this, we can really, really learn what is in these. So this is a screenshot of my program. I have been helping debug this program, make it usable for the next person to do this. And it's been an experience. <laughs> it really has. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see what the spectra that I use look like. This is a beautiful spectra. It has magnesium and it has iron and sodium, the three things we really want to look at to classify what, we're, what we have. And what I really, really learned is just how much you can see from the colors in your spectrum. So thank you. Hello, my name is Yuta Takagi and my mentor is Dr. Pascal Lee. Um, my project this summer was to conduct a literature review of water on Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars. Um, as it turns out, not very much is known about this topic because uh, there have been no dedicated um, spacecraft missions that have successfully made it to these bodies. Their infrared, sp infrared spectroscopy reveals that there are no hydrated mineral bands. Um, however, spectroscopy uh, can only definitively tell us about the surface of the moon. and doesn't necessarily reflect the interior. Important analytical models suggest that um, if the moons had a large initial ice water component, then they could retain ice in their interiors today, but it would have sublimated away from the surface. Um, their low bulk densities can be used to constrain the uh, amount of, present, uh, of water present today. Um, the, the amount of initial water on these bodies depends heavily on their origin, which is um, a very disputed topic. If the bodies, if the moons formed through accretional processes, as uh, suggested by their current orbital, the shape of their current orbits, then it is unlikely that there is any water present. However, if they are captured asteroids or comets, as uh, suggested by their spectra, then they could have initially had a large amount of water and could retain a portion of that today. Um, based on the second scenario and using bulk density as a constraint, I calculated um, their maximum possible water contents. And as you can see, these are extremely high values. 40% um, for Phobos and uh, 55 for Deimos. Um, however, these are very uh, generous maximum estimates. Um, and I don't believe that either body actually has this much water. Um, that being said, even if Phobos or Deimos contained just 5% water by mass, uh, this would still provide huge insight into the early history of our solar system and uh, represents a very important resource for future human space exploration. So in conclusion, I would like to uh, endorse dedicated 
spacecraft missions to characterize these two enigmatic bodies. Thank you. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Shannon Asadio, and I'm a rising junior at Cal Poly Pomona studying aerospace engineering. My mentor is also Dr. Pascal Lee, and the project I was given was to develop precursor measurements for human exploration to Phobos and Deimos. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what Phobos and Deimos are, or just forgot, um, they are the moons of Mars. And so the scenario for my project is that before um, humans will explore Mars, we're going to explore Phobos and Deimos. So um, however, the process before human expor exploration missions are feasible, um, robotic precursor missions are, are required in order to develop these or understand these unknowns of Phobos and Deimos. So these unknowns are um, what, precursor measure, what precursor measurements are derived from. And this is what my project focuses on. So at the beginning of my project, I compiled all this information from NASA and all these other organizations. However, these organizations focused on very general ideas, such as lunar missions and Mars missions and small bodies missions. So what I had to do was derive um, ideas from them to implement them to Phobos and Deimos. So these papers focused on strategic knowledge gaps, which are basically unknowns that we don't know. And so SKGs, uh, strategic knowledge gaps, are divided into themes, categories, and examples. So I found out um, Phobos and Deimos related uh, SKGs. So an example, as you can see here, uh, the first one is to understand the environment of PhD. PhD is Phobos and Deimos. And going more into depth of that is to understand the regolith environment, which is um, basically the outer layer of the surface. And then going into more depth, um, is an example of understanding the mechanical properties. So I was able to come up with um, about 10 or more examples. And from these examples, these SKG examples, you're, you're um, able to derive measurements. So an example I have here is the size, shape, and continuity of macropores. And macropores are basically cavities in these um, grains that um, if we're able to understand this, we'll be able to measure the macro porosity, and which is important because it influences the solubility and determines the particulate compaction. This is important if um, the regolith gets in contact with water or gets in contact with um, vehicles and other crew members. So in conclusion of my project, I was able to come up with about 20 or more um, measurements which answer these unknowns, these strategic knowledge gaps. And um, so this, <laughs> This proposal will be sent to NASA, and hopefully they will implement it to their Phobos and Deimos plan. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Haywood. I am a chemistry student at California State University, San Marcos. And my mentor this summer was Dr. Richard Quinn. The research we were doing was the synthesis of calcium sulfate for use as a Mars simulant. Our objective was to evaluate how well biomarkers, specifically those of fatty acids, are preserved in calcium sulfate. The reason we looked at calcium sulfate was because sulfur in the form of sulfates has been inferred to be on Mars, and has l this has later been confirmed by the Mars Science Laboratory that it is in the form of calcium sulfate in different um, phases of hydration. We also know that organics are present on Mars and have even been found in Martian meteorites. And that more recently, long chain carboxylic acids have also been found on Mars, or at least might, might have been found. So the question we asked was, can we see how well calcium sulfate could preserve those long chain carboxylic acids, otherwise known as fatty acids? The way we did this was we set up an experiment where we decided to precipitate out our own calcium sulfate crystals using a method by paper Wang et al. 2012, where you take sodium sulfate solution and calcium chloride solution and mix them together in equal amounts to get a given concentration of calcium sulfate in solution. And the reason we did it this way is because by choosing what time you filter those crystals as they form, 
you can control which state of hydration they're in so we can replicate which phases of calcium sulfate are actually on Mars. And the next step is to take, the, take fatty acids, specifically 2-ethylhexanoic acid, oleic acid, and palmitic acid, and mix them with that calcium sulfate solution so that as the crystals of calcium sulfate form, they, would trap those, they will trap those fatty acids inside their structures. This is important because we can s then test how well those fatty acids are preserved in those crystals. This research is still ongoing. We have been able to successfully use this method to synthesize calcium sulfate crystals. And the next step is to take the sa these samples of calcium sulfate and fatty acids in their structure and put them into a variety of different experimental conditions that will replicate the environment on Mars. And hopefully this will give us a better insight into how well organic molecules can be preserved in, Mar in Martian, in the Martian soil, specifically in calcium sulfate. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Paige Morkner. I'm from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, and my mentor is Virginia Gulick. And I will be presenting on the two different ways that I've been doing remote exploration of Mars surface processes this summer. The first thing I've been doing this summer is hand sample analyses. So hand sample analyses is looking at different rocks within the lab collection that we have and figuring out what type of rock it is based off of the mineral composition. Every Rocks are made up of minerals and each mineral has its own characteristic diagnostic properties that will allow you to identify it in hand sample. The different percents of different types of minerals identified within the rock are used to identify what type of rock we're looking at. This uh, Method hand sample analysis is recorded, and then each rock has its has a spectra taken of it using a Raman spectrometer, which um, gives peaks that allow us to identify different minerals seen in the spectra of the rock. Together, these two pieces of information are used to uh, possibly create a future rock classifier that will, may be used to explore different places and do autonomous scientific study and uh, decrease time for data retrieval for these different places where we're doing exploration. The other thing that I've been doing this summer um, for Mars surface processes studies involves using uh, digital terrain models made from the high-rise images that are taken from the high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. These digital terrain models can be used to draw transects over different gullies on, uh, that are forming in crater walls in different craters on Mars. So gullies are forming and we can draw lines across the gullies which allow us to draw topographic profiles here. Here you see this yellow one and drawn on the side you can see a yellow line across the alcove of this gully. The gullies are have uh, an alcove, a channel, and an apron. The alcove and the channel are the areas that are removed when the gully forms, and the apron is the area where the material removed is deposited. Um, using this method, we can figure out the different areas removed and the different areas deposited, and compare the two quantities, and po po possibly figure out um, what volatile reactions may have caused these gullies to form. Um, and that's it. Hello, my name is Kaylee Brower. I'm studying physics and astrophysics at Brown University, and today I'll be telling you about 2000 RS11, which is an unusual near-Earth asteroid I modeled this summer. Specifically, my project goal was to study archival radar data to learn about its shape and its spin state. You can see here behind me some of the actual radar images I used in my modeling, and next to those are radar images from my model. So you can see I was trying to create a model that would reproduce the radar images that we saw. This is actually my model. You can see the principal axis views of RS-11 here. And the highlighted yellow portions are portions of RS-11 that were observed at greater than 60 degree angles of incidence. So we don't have very good information on those portions, but we do on the rest. You can see to the left 
the um, information about the volume and some dimensions, and below it is information about the spin state. I would like to point out that there are two ecliptic pole directions that I determined, and those correspond to two uh, shape models that equally fit the data, and those are mirror images of each other. The reason for this is because there was an inherent north-south ambiguity in the radar images that we were using. So portions of the asteroid in the northern, northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere would plot to the same point in the radar image, so we have two models that fit equally well. There are also two obliquities corresponding to the two pole directions. An obliquity is if this is the plane of orbit, and it's orbiting like this, and it's perpendicular to that plane, obliquity is the angle off a of perpendicular. So this would be zero degrees, 180 degrees, and you can see that RS-11 is somewhere in between. Now there are some unusual results that I found through my modeling. I was just talking about obliquity. Zero degree obliquity is called prograde motion, and 180 is retrograde motion. Asteroids tend to be forced into these types of motions by thermal radiation from the sun. So it's interesting that RS-11 is far from either of these types of motions. The shape is also unusual when compared to other contact binary asteroids that have been observed. You can see some classic examples there at the bottom, Itakawa and Tautis. And when you compare RS-11 to those asteroids, you can see it looks quite a bit different. Uh, for one, the large lobe of RS-11 is unusually flattened. And also, there's an uncommon location of its smaller lobe. While most of the asteroids we have seen, the smaller lobe is at the end of the larger lobe. But in the case of RS-11, it's kind of on the side there, you can see. These were some interesting things I was able to determine through my modeling this summer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mara Zimmerman, and I'm from Juniata College, where I study physics. And I worked with Susan Mullally this summer. And I worked to determine if a set of highly eccentric binary stars, called heartbeat stars, had pseudo-synchronized by measuring the rotation from stellar spots. There are currently 166 heartbeat stars discovered with Kepler. And um, I worked with all of them in the beginning. And these stars are highly eccentric binary systems with tidally induced dynamic distortions. They're also the largest population of stars found with tidally induced pulsations. And because of the dynamic tidal distortions, the stars themselves are very circular at apastron, but become a lot more oblate as they approach periastron until they get to the point where they're, they're very oblate, um, as demonstrated by the figures both in, in, in an eclipsing example and a non-eclipsing example up there. So um, here's a sample light curve and Fourier analysis that I worked with in the beginning. As you can see in the Fourier transform, um, the heartbeat is a, at a very discrete, regular frequency, and it's pointed out with the pink arrows, but the rotation signature in these stars is often less discrete. And out of the 166 uh, stars in the beginning, 16 showed signs of rotation. So using the program called Period 04, I used the Fourier uh, transform to find the rotation signatures and determine the rotation periods. For these 16 stars, I also modeled them using a program called Phoebe, which stands for Physics of Eclipsing Binaries. And I use this mainly to get the eccentricity out. Here you can see one of the uh, fits I came up with. The blue line is the folded and binned light curve, and the red line is the Phoebe model. And the eccentricity is really determined by the uh, width of the light curve, or the width of the dip in the light curve. So after the eccentricities were got out, um, I could calculate the pseudo-synchronization for these stars, and the uh, theory behind pseudo-synchronization was published in 1981, and it essentially says that because of the tidal friction in these binary systems, the stars synchronize fairly quickly, at least in terms of stellar timescales. And since they're highly eccentric, they don't really synchronize, but instead go through pseudo-synchronization, which is very similar, and it's dependent on the orbital period and eccentricity. So if these stars had pseudo-synchronized, you would expect most of them on this graph to fall on the one-to-one -one line, but in fact a good deal are above the line, which is very unusual, and it indicates that they really haven't pseudo-synchronized yet, and further examination uh, may reveal that other physical effects are keeping them from synchronizing. So that's what I did this summer. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Carnes. I study astrogeophysics at Colgate University. And this summer I worked with my mentor, Dr. Jeff Smith, along with Dr. Doug Caldwell and Taryn Carey on our project, Detecting K2 Campaign 3 Planet Candidates. And I'm going to talk to you about the first half of our project, which deals with the science processing pipeline that we used to detect these planet candidates. 
So first, I want to give you a little bit of background on the K2 mission. K2 is the successor to the Kepler mission. So when two of Kepler's reaction wheels failed, it was unable to continue with its original mission. However, by using the two remaining reaction wheels and solar pressure, the spacecraft has been able to continue making observations. So K2 now observes targets that lie in the ecliptic and it moves to a new field of view for each 90-day campaign. And this image here shows some of the fields of view that K2 has or is going to observe. So the pipeline that was originally developed for the Kepler mission has uh, five parts. The first is pixel level calibrations that just calibrates the pixels as they're taken off of the spacecraft. The second is photometric analysis. So in the image in the lower left, um, you can see the target in the center and it's surrounded by a dotted white line. The dotted white line represents the optimal aperture that is calculated for each target. And that's the area within which we measure the flux. And we plot that over time to create the raw light curves. The third step of the pipeline is pre-search data conditioning, or PDC, and PDC produces corrected light curves. So if you look at the other plot in the bottom right, you can see this very clear sawtooth pattern, um, and that's very characteristic of all K2 data. This is caused by um, spacecraft roll, and the spacecraft rolls because the solar pressure that we rely on for pointing isn't completely balanced, and so the spacecraft um, continually begins to roll one direction, and thrusters are fired every six hours to bring it back to its original position. So you can see that, um, the sawtooth pattern is clear in the blue data from before PDC, but then if you look at the red data on the same plot, that's from after PDC was run, and it fit and removed many systematics, including the sawtooth pattern, um, and the data looks much cleaner there. The fourth step of the pipeline is the transiting planet search, or TPS. TPS fits transit models that vary in period, phase, and duration to the corrected light curves. And if it finds a signal in the data that matches a given transit model sufficiently well, it returns that as a threshold crossing event. When we ran TPS on the entire C3 data set, um, TPS returned 879 threshold crossing events. So if you look at the top plot here, this again shows the difference um, in the data from before and after PDC. Before PDC, you can see that the scale of the sawtooth is much larger than the scale of the transit depth, um, making the transit very hard to detect. Once the sawtooth has been removed, the transit becomes visible. And then the lower plot is an example of a plot that TPS returns when it finds a threshold crossing event, and it's showing one of the transits that it detected there. Um, so next, you're going to hear from Taryn, and she's going to tell you about the second half of our project. Hello, um, my name is Taryn Carey. I'm an astrophysics major at the University of Oklahoma. And this summer, I worked with my mentor, Dr. Doug Caldwell, as well as Dr. Jeff Smith and fellow SETI intern Katie Carnes on detecting planet candidates in the K2 Campaign 3 data. <laughs> Katie just gave a lot of great background on the K2 mission as well as the beginning stages of the pipeline. So I'm gonna kind of skip ahead to the results. After TPS is run, we run the results through something called data validation. What data validation does is it uses statistics to determine the probability that the transit-like signal we're seeing is actually attributed to a transiting planet and not something like noise in the light curve, an uncorrected thrust thruster firing, or an eclipsing binary. Um, it's important to note that DV was originally designed for the Kepler mission, which has much cleaner light curves and much less um, motion-induced noise. So some of these tests that were done in DV weren't necessarily physically meaningful, but a lot of them were, and these are three such examples that we looked at. The first, comparing the signal-to-noise ratio in the multiple event statistic. The MES is um, a determination of how well a simplified transit model fits to the light curve. And the SNR is a measure of how well a physical model fits to the light curve. So you would expect it, if it's something physical, for the SNR to be a better fit than the MES. So it should be equal or greater than in value. And in, in this such example from our sample, you can see that that is the case, which is a good sign. Two other tests we looked at were the odd even test and the weak secondary test, which basically test the probability of the detection actually being an eclipsing binary. And in this case, it also passes tests as well. So we, um, it's more likely to be a planet. So now talking about the catalog itself, out of the 879 threshold crossing events that Katie talked about, we narrowed that down to 73 very good targets. And from those targets, we um, picked out 41 planet candidates in 33 systems. This is one such planet candidate from our sample. The bottom figure is the light curve with the individual transits indicated with the blue triangles at the bottom. The top is the folded light curve on period, so you can more clearly see the transit feature. For this target, it had a period of 2.4 days and a planet radius of roughly two Earth radii, which is really exciting that we're finding planets of this size um, and smaller in our sample. 
Um, current and future work would include doing a write-up or uh, publishing a formal catalog, returning to the good and very good candidates that we had to skip in the interest of time efficiency, and applying this method to other campaigns. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Isabel Angelo. I study physics and astrophysics at the University of California at Berkeley. And this summer I've been working under Dr. Jason Rowe to do false positive analysis of Kepler planet candidates. Specifically, I've been working with a star called KOI 3138 and tra transit signals around it. If confirmed, KOI 3138 is a single planet system with a Venus-like exoplanet orbiting a cool M-type star. Um, so this is an artist's interpretation of what that system might look like. To validate a planet candidate, we need to be sure that our transit signals are not due to an astrophysical false positive. So a false positive source could be a binary companion around the transit star, or a binary system or transiting planet system in the background of our target star. So basically, any star nearby our target star is suspicious and needs to be considered in false positive analysis. The way we account for these possible false positive sources is by taking high resolution images of the target star to see if we can detect any false positive sources. And the way this is working is um, shown by the figure on the right. So our target star might look something like this in Kepler, but if you take a higher resolution image with more pixels, it could look like this, where you have a target star and then a potential false positive source next to it. We use a variety of different sources for these kinds of imagings on KOI 3138, um, namely the UK Infrared Telescope, Speckle Imaging, and Digital Sky Survey. And fortunately, we didn't detect any false positive sources, which really strengthened the candidacy for KOI 3138 as a planet. Here's a little bit of data. So on the left, you have the raw transit curve. And we can actually learn a lot about the planet from this transit curve alone. So the depth of the transit indicates the size of the planet relative to the size of the star. And then the time between transits gives us the period, which we can use to calculate the distance from the host star and the incident flux received from the host star. And that's plotted on our figure here to the right. So um, we have incident flux on the x-axis and then radius on the y-axis. And there's actually um, two really important things to note about this diagram. The first is that KOI 3138, as indicated by the blue region on the diagram, is really similar to Venus, much more so than any of the other exoplanets plotted here. And then the second thing to note is that it's similar in size to Kepler-186f. So Kepler-186f, just like KOR 3138, is Earth size and around a cool M-type star. However, Kepler-186f is on the outer reaches of its star's habitable zone, while KOR 3138 is orbiting much closer in. So together, these two planets actually span the range of habitable zone distances around M-type stars, and upon further analysis, could give us some really exciting insight into M-dwarf habitability. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Blunt, and in the fall I'm gonna be a junior at Brown University. This summer I worked under Eric Nielsen and Frank Marchis on a, on a project entitled Distinguishing Exoplanets from Background Objects Using Random Orbit Generation for the Gemini Planet Imager. So for those of you that have been living under a rock the past couple of days, the Gemini Planet Imager is a direct imaging infrared instrument that's placed on the Gemini South Telescope in Hawaii. And I insinuated that you've been living under a rock if you haven't heard of this because GPI discovered a planet. It's amazing. Um, so, um, so what the point of my project was to generate millions of random orbits that fit GPI data. And using these orbits, we can take statistics on the possible orbital um, configurations um, that work for a specific set of orbits. Um, and. Um, and we can compare these statistics to the probabilities that's, that, um, the, that the thing that we've observed is a background object or a brown dwarf or other astronomical object that got in the way of GPIs, um, that got in the way of GPIs, um, sorry, that got in the way of GPIs uh, picture and looks like a, looks accidentally like a planet. So the way that we generate these random orbits, first we generate random orbital elements, um, everything that you need to get a planet. Um, and then we solve this orbit at a future at the first observational epoch, and we compare the um, the position that the random orbit generator um, spits out to the actual position that we observe on GPI. 
Um, then we scale the semi-major axis of the re generated orbit and we rotate the position angle of nodes. So we change around the orbital parameters so that the generated orbit fits the um, observed orbit. And then we incorporate measured uncertainties to make our generated orbits more realistic. And finally, we reject orbits that don't fit any remaining observational epochs. So we change around the orbits to fit the first observational epoch, and then we reject all additional um, orbits that don't fit the rest of the epochs. So the results that I produced look something like this. On the your left, uh, you can see histograms of simulated displacements for a million generated orbits as a function of time. So each one of these histograms corresponds to uh, uh, where, the plan where the planet is most likely to be after different units of time. And I've overplotted the GPI pixel size as a vertical dashed line so you can get a sense of GPI's detectability. On the right, or yep, on the left, sorry, <laughs> is another representation of these results. These are two sigma contour lines for where 95% of the simulated orbits would be after different units of time in RA and deck space or projected location on the sky. Um, and those, or those results were fit to only one observational epoch. So these results are fits to all of the observational epochs of 51 Ari B that GPI has taken so far. So these are histograms for the output separations and position angles, which you can think of as, um, as polar locations relative to the star of 51 Ari B. Um, and I've overplotted the initial separation and position angle of 51 Ari B as measured on December 18th. Um, and then you can see the most likely uh, separation and position angle after uh, in August 27th when we next uh, when we next see this planet. So we're most likely to see a significant amount of orbital motion. Thank you. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Rosa Maria Diaz. I am an electrical engineering student at Cal Poly Pomona. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the project that I worked on this summer with my mentor, Dr. Jerry Harp, titled Time Resolved Spectral Analysis of Blazar 0714 plus 716 data. Okay, so to begin with, let's just pretend that that blazar image is the blazar that we are actually studying. A blazar is a compact quasar that is presumed to have a supermassive black hole at its center, um, and it emits signals that interact with the electrons in the intergalactic medium, which cause them to arrive at different times at our um, telescope. So by studying these arrival times, uh, we can determine the dispersion measure, and the dispersion measure is useful in studying the evolution of the universe. So prior to my arrival here at SETI, uh, we had archived data from this blazar taken by the Allen Telescope Array. The Allen Telescope Array is an interferometer of 42 dishes, and it has a correlator that computes a power versus frequency spectrum for every pair of antennas. So for 42 antennas, that's a lot of data, which is very difficult to analyze. So we wanna find um, something to simplify that data. So what we used is a method called the bispectrum. And you can kind of think of the bispectrum as the average, but it takes triads of antennas um, that form a closed loop, as you can see in our image. Uh, it multiplies them together and then takes the uh, average of the cube root. So the majority of my project was spent coming up with a program using Java uh, that would take in the archive data, would compute the bispectrum, and then would output fits images. So as you can see, these are some of the images that we came up with for two different days. Uh, the vertical lines represent times in which the Allen Telescope Array stopped to look at something other than the blazar, so um, something else, like the calibrator. Uh, the horizontal lines represent flagged frequencies, so frequencies that were just bad, so we just took them out of our image. Um, the earlier times of the observation are seen by the beginning of the image, and the end of the image is the later time of observation. So because we know the times that these two features in the center occurred, we can attribute them to the sun, so we know that they're not real. It's just basically radio frequency interference, so it's RFI. Um, we wanted to get rid of that RFI, so we increased our surveying frequency to 30, 40 megahertz, as you can see in the image below. And here you can see there is no RFI, but there are also no interesting features. So, <laughs> yeah, um, basically, after looking at several different images, 
Our conclusion was that the features we observed in our images were associated with the sun or other forms of RFI, and maybe the expected time variations in our blazar emission are too weak in our data to pursue our desired analysis of dispersion measure. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gage Edgar, and this summer I worked on an optical study project with Elliot Gillum. I did two things, uh, two main things. The first thing I worked on was modeling sensitivity, and the sensitivity of the CCDs, as you see there, uh, is a function of several parameters, and uh, the the parameters uh, are no parameters that we know very well. M a lot of them are uh, provided by the manufacturer, like the n background noise. Uh, but the second part of the uh, of the calculation to calculate range is uh, calculating the photon flux of a of a pulse. And a lot this is this side of the equation is kind of like the Drake equation because we don't know uh, a lot of these parameters because the extraterrestrials are going to choose uh, the values of these parameters, such as the wavelength. And we're hoping they choose a monochromatic w wavelength, because that's what we're looking for in this system. And so when we set the two uh, equations, photon flux and camera sensitivity, equal to each other, we will uh, be able to explore the parameter space and learn how the range of our system varies based on uh, varying the parameters. One very important thing uh, that I learned is that the closer we are to ET, uh, the more logical it would be for them to choose a lower, a shorter wavelength laser like green or blue. And we want them to choose green because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs green light the least. The second thing I did this summer was work on the detection software. I'll give you an overview of, th of that. The, uh, the software has to look for the right shape. It's going to, as you see there, it's, uh, it looks like that. It's called an airy disk. And uh, the software checks row by row, um, but we have to make, take into account the fact that the pulse, l like those uh, dots on the white uh, picture, will are probably spread over several uh, rows. And then after, after that, you have to match the dot with another dot uh, because the the way our optical system works, we the uh, optical system will split a light pulse into two spots, and uh, that will indicate that we have what we were looking for instead of many false positives that would show up as one dot. And so uh, I'm very grateful for how far I got with this uh, code. But the next step would be to account for different sized laser. Uh, different sized dots. As you see, the dots do uh, vary in size, and I'm just, the code right now is looking for the average sized uh, dot. So uh, that's, that would be next for the code. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Herman, and I work today, uh, work, this, work this summer on an optical city project with my mentor, Elliot Gillum. I also collaborate with Dr. Jerry Harp, Dr. Lawrence Doyle, and Dr. Seth Shostak. Um, my project was working with an, ex an expensive proposal to do an all-sky, all-the-time survey looking for nanosecond light pulses. Um, we start off by looking with um, two dispersive prisms that have been glued back to back on top of our CCD camera sensor uh, as an alternative to what the proposal said of having two Amici prisms together. And the dispersive prism, we're looking to get two of the same picture side by side. And our first lens, which is a 25 millimeter lens, gave us a cross eye view, which wasn't what we were looking for. So we replaced that with a 4 millimeter lens, which gave us our side by side pictures, but it wasn't giving us the spectrums we were looking to get in order to sense the nanosecond light pulses separate from spectrums. So we went back to Alan's proposal, which I have some of his ZMAX pictures here from his software that we, I looked at, trying to determine how much spread we got on the CCD camera sensors, but I was having trouble 
but so I did some some math, the dispersion prism calculations, and I was able to see that we did get dispersion out of the Amici prisms, but I was having trouble getting the me measurement path from the Amici prisms into the camera sensor. So I kept looking at ZMAX, and we were able to talk, talk to Adam Finis, who was able to make the spectrum you saw on Gage's slide. Um, this allowed us to see more of what we're looking for, but Elliot, my mentor, had another idea, because the Amici prisms were still too expensive, uh, at least to consider right now, um, which was to have a transmission grating. The transmission grating would give you um, an interference pattern spectrum, which, as you can see here, we have the, f the zero, the first, second, third orders. And while we used a blaze transmission grating, which gives you an uneven first on either side, we'd use one that's non-blaze, which gives you an even spectrum. And looking at the first order spectrum, we'd be able to tell exactly where a laser, laser light pulse would be versus the spectrum. Um, unfortunately, my measurement said that only 33% of the light was getting through the transmission grating. So I need to go back, and my next step would be to go back and do more measurements to be sure that we can get enough light in to have enough sensitivity so we can have a cheap system that can do an all-sky all-the-time survey for nanosecond light pulses. Also, um, the next step from the project would be to get more hardware, different cameras, different transmission grading, like I mentioned, and be able to make the system optimized. Thank you. Let's give all of our students another round of applause. Those were really excellent talks. Just to remind you, all of this research that you heard about today was completed in just 10 weeks over the summer, and that was including one week of a field trip where they weren't really able to work on their specific project. So they've made really incredible progress over this entire summer session. Um, at this point, I'd like to open the floor up for questions from the audience. You can ask questions about anybody's research projects, or if you want to ask questions about the internship program itself, I'm happy to answer them now as well. Oh, good. <laughs> Is there, oh, good. Um, the talk about 2000 RS11, that's the asteroid. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the, s the shape is very similar to the shape of... Um, 67P? Yeah, P yeah. So did you compare the size and the shape? And the, could, could it be that this is a dormant comet? And the reason for which you have such a high obliquity is because you have an activity quite recent, and that's why it did not stabilize. We were considering that. We don't know enough right now to be able to say that, but it's definitely a possibility. Um, it's, oh, it's an S type, so it's very rocky, so it's unlikely on the ice, but. So what is it gonna take to get KOI 3138 to a Kepler uh, approved planet? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think we probably need to do a little bit of statistic, um, statistical analysis that we missed the binary. Um, so we can do that by using galaxy models to estimate the star density in the region where the star was detected and then say what are the odds that there was a background blend that we didn't detect um, and then statistically get the odds of that. Usually it's somewhere around like 99.97% sure that it's a planet and then after we meet a certain threshold it'll be classified as a Kepler planet if we decide to do that. Uh, about heartbeat stars, um, what are some of the mechanisms that would keep them from damping, like you said? Do um, you have any speculations about that? Uh, keep them from pseudo-synchronizing? Yes. Uh, um, well, I'm not entirely sure about that, but one speculation is that there's an unseen third body in the eccentric system, which could keep them at this very highly eccentric orbit instead of having them synchronize. Uh, I was struck by the error bar on the uh, DEMOS uh, water content by, by mass, and I was wondering uh, if that's a result of the size of the, of the uh, satellite. So uh, some observation, this is uh, mostly observational error. Um, some, Phobos is pretty well, comparatively well characterized because um, uh, orbital spacecraft in Mars orbit have taken uh, opportunistic observations of the body. Uh, Deimos is a lot harder to 
uh, characterize, and that, that's where that error comes from. Um, so I'm kind of curious about the uh, nanosecond pulses from space. Uh, why would we expect those, or what's the motivation for trying to observe that, I guess? The motivation for the nanosecond light pulses is that they be unnatural. Um, it's shorter than anything that can be uh, produced by nature. Um, also, having, having, having two of them uh, on your sensor means that you could rule out cosmic rays, and also the spectrum narrows it down from being a white light source or a star. So because we're assuming they're using lasers. <laughs> we make a few assumptions, but it's, it's basically to check off part of something that says, hey, they're not doing this. Uh, so on the Blazar uh, talk, the resulting uh, spectra, there was one that was a lot of solar noise and uh, the one that didn't have any meaningful results. Uh, what's the next, now that you've gotten to that point, what's, uh, what's your next plan of attack? Um, so we want to make our program to be more, like, more sensitive because we think that right now it's not picking anything up just because it doesn't have the right sensitivity. Um, and we also want to observe different um, sources, not just the Blazar or Galactic Center. Um, we have different sources that we want to observe because maybe there's just nothing there. So maybe like we can pick something up from a different source. Um, about the lab measurement uh, on Mars, um, you mentioned no, no. <laughs> you mentioned that you uh, you've managed to uh, to mix. Um, these um, molecules, lipid, I think it is. Um, what kind of biomarker, what kind of signature you expect to see in the future? Do you have an idea of that? Um, we actually haven't got, gotten to that point where we can actually actually see what, ha what happens if you, if the fatty acid, basically the point is to see if we can detect the fatty acids in the crystals after they've been after they've been mixed with them, then that means, and under different conditions, that means that it could calcium sulfate could be a good, a good place to look if there are any potential any potential signs of those organic molecules. But if they, but if they are not detected, or if they break, or if they break down into some simpler form, then it means that calcium sulfate would not be a good indicate a good place to look. Does that answer your question? Okay. Same guy, actually. Um, Follow-on question from that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm still not clear. Are you looking at calcium sulfate because you have reason to suspect that it will be particularly good as a biomarker preserver among the things that are on Mars? Um, we were looking at we were looking at it because it's n it's not particularly re it doesn't seem like something that would be particularly reactive and it's and it's fa fairly ab abundant we've also I didn't mention in this one but there's also been orbital data that shows that it's not just at the landing sites but all over Mars so it's just another thing to, to look at and consider I think they did an awesome job absolutely awesome job and as Gene pointed out you know, this is just 10 weeks of work. But when you consider also, you know, the breadth of research that the students have been involved with, so we've talked about surface chemistry of planets, we've talked about spectra of asteroids, we've talked about uh, Kepler data, we've talked about GPI, um, ground-based telescope imaging of exoplanets. So the, the, just the breadth and, and depth of the science I think is representative of, of the great work, not only of the students, but also of the mentors. And I would like to give a, a round of applause to the mentors for all of their support. They did a great job. It's a, it's a wonderful marriage, I would say, in general. So I had another technical question, which um, is speculative, and we may not have computers large enough to determine this, but how many boxes of pizza did we go through uh, over the course of the summers? <laughs> there were massive amounts of pizza consumed as a result of this, and we, we have taken some of, our, some of our financial resources and invested them in that local pizza parlor, so we, we're looking for a good return on investment. But thank you again for, for joining us today and for joining the colloquium series, and I hope you get another sense that this is, uh, you know, even the work that, we, uh, that, 
that is done here in terms of donated support for the Institute is part of that is what goes into supporting great programs like the REU program. And we hope, of course, to continue this for many years to come. So we thank you for your attention and thank you for your time and your patronage and for being here today to support the students. And great job again to all of you for, for your wonderful work and that the really good presentations. I didn't hear anybody go over the three limit three minute line. Huh? <laughs> <coughs> you won't be back next year then. That's it. <laughs> no, everybody everybody did a really good job and, and very sharp and very crisp. So well done and thanks again very much.